All right. So the last step of the pipeline is sort of the big end model that we actually want to train using Snorkel. So the whole pitch here is you know that um, off the shelf machine learning stuff has become pretty commodity and it does a really good job. The deep learning stuff that's coming online is a really great job of learning in the presence of lots of labeled data. So we want to use Snorkel to produce these massive training sets and then use some fancy state of the art discriminative models uh, like deep neural networks to build models that we then actually can use in deployment. And the most intuitive way I think about um, sort of this step in the pipeline is as a compiler. So you're compiling your rules, your labeling functions into features, right? And the sort of big hype area now for machine learning is this idea of representation learning, this automatic feature extraction. And you can think of broadly as Snorkel compiling rules into representations that are used for uh, making predictions. So be kind of thinking about uh, this uh, process in, in those terms as I talk about this. So as I said, the output of the generative model, right, we've learned these latent accuracies, and now we have emitted a marginal probability for every one of our training candidates. This is just some zero to one value that tells us our confidence in being a true or false label. So normally when we train machine learning stuff, uh, we use a hard label, zero or one. Now we're training on this sort of more informative label that's uh, some uh, probability. And this gives you, uh, this is just a, a revisit to the slide that Steve showed this morning. And it just says the full sort of uh, snorkel stack now. You know, we started with writing labeling functions. This encodes our weak supervision. We pass that to our generative model. We learn these latent um, weights that is correspond to accuracies of our labeling functions or experts to uh, learn this you know, you know, latent unseen true label. We emit a marginal probability and then we feed it into a discriminative model. And again, in this context, we're gonna look at uh, what's called an LSTM. That's a long short-term memory. That's just a uh, neural network. In fact, this works with a lot of different discriminative models like logistic regression um, and uh, basically anything that we can modify the loss function for. So the nice thing, the sort of big finding, and Alex was here, but um, the paper that he's the lead on is the data programming paper that sort of lays out the theoretical foundations for Snorkel. And the cool thing is that our generalization error associated with um, uh, supervised learning that we are long familiar with is the same in our data programming context, except in the amount of unlabeled data. So we're taking these marginals and we're feeding them in and we're minimizing this noise aware loss function. And again, our input's only really labeling functions. This noise aware loss is really the only difference in the discriminative model side. And all that translates is to, instead of fitting to the classic supervised learning setting of hard labels, we're now fitting to the expectation of our uh, provided noise-aware noise labels. Okay? You can actually, um, yeah, so th this is largely uh, everything we've implemented in Snorkel for the discriminative model has this loss function implemented. So it's not a particularly um, uh, complicated thing, and it's sort of provided to you out of box and all the Snorkel stuff that we support. So the number one question I would say, probably everyone asks about Snorkel, um, is why can't we just use the generative model as our classifier, right? We write a bunch of labeling functions, we generate a probability of being a true candidate. Isn't that enough? It, haven't we built a machine learning system that captures a lot of information? And certainly you can, you can use it as a classifier, but sort of the advantage of data programming and Snorkel is that you know, uh, labeling functions encode a bunch of information, right? So you have some 10 or 20 labeling functions. You can use those to make some prediction over some coverage of candidates. But really, that's it. You're sort of limited by what the labeling functions touch, right? The advantage of taking basically this labeled subset of what the uh, labeling functions generate for your training set and training a, a generative or a discriminative model is that we learn a feature representation of our labeling functions. We translate the you know, 25 dimensional labeling function into some potentially million dimensional feature space. And what that buys you isn't just like arbitrary complexity, you're learning a more general representation 
of the knowledge that you encoded in labeling functions. And what this buys you is the ability to get more coverage, you can visit more candidates, and you generalize better to candidates you've never seen. So you are trading what we see in practice is a little bit of precision in your model for a big bump in recall. And just to motivate this with actual numbers, this is from a, a paper in progress that, that I'm working on with some others, is that if you were to take a, a, a disease tagging task, this is just NER in, a, in the CDR demo that uh, uh, Stephen talked about this morning, if you were to write a bunch of labeling functions, you'd get a majority vote of about 71.5 F1 measure. If you were to take it into the generative model and denoise it, you get about 72. So you do a little better, you know, you denoise your rules. If you were to take this into basically structured logistic regression, um, you get a big bump of almost five points, right? And what you're doing then is you're translating this, you know, 40 rules into some crazy logistic regression feature space that includes all of the manual features you see in text mining, like word windows and dependency tree parses and everything, et cetera, et cetera. So you spend a lot of time feature, doing hand feature engineering here. But we can also use like a state-of-the-art LSTM. So these long-term short -term memories, they learn their own features. They have pretty arbitrary, complicated ways to search over sequences of text. You don't do any feature engineering here. You just feed it a bunch of data. And if you feed this between like 25,000 and 100,000 PubMed abstracts, you find that in fact you can do better than your hand engineered case. And this puts you on par with the supervised learning um, setting is if you trained uh, this model on hand human labeled data. And that's sort of the, 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 the ordering you'd hope to expect with this data programming stack is that you match or exceed supervised learning scores, and you get this kind of ordering amongst um, the methods. And just to give a little more uh, detail on this for, the, um, for scaling, the great thing about Snorkel is that you've built a software package, right? These labeling functions aren't like hand-labeled data, they aren't static. You can use them and deploy them to generate arbitrarily large training sets. This is me looking at 1,000 PubMed abstracts scaling it all the way up to 100,000 abstracts, right? So now you can train on these massive data sets required to really take advantage of deep learning algorithms. And it's something that you can change and modify. So uh, this isn't on this slide, but this is for, again, tagging disease names in PubMed. If you take a lot of these labeling functions and apply them to another disease tagging task, say like in an EHR or in a different um, annotated PubMed data set, you still get to keep a lot of the same labeling functions. These are software artifacts. They translate with um, some degree of noise to other you know, validation sets. So it's uh, much easier to take this knowledge and lift it and apply it into other areas, which is a huge advantage um, over just hand labeling some subset of data. And again, we can match or exceed supervised learning performance. Uh, this dashed line over here, this is just our F1 score. Again, this is the number of documents. But this is what you get if you train on hand-labeled data. And you see, you just keep feeding it information, and eventually you do better. We can now look at our uh, RNN and see what our performance is. So like, this is me. I just threw some labeling functions together. Um, I trained my model in 214 seconds, and I'm getting an F1 of 23. So this is a drop from my uh, generative model, where I was getting a 41. And if you see why, it's because I probably just don't have very good coverage, right? That would be my guess, yeah. Jason, if you were to train your discriminant model for more epochs, might it yes. be better? Yes, why well, that's a very good question, Alex. So. Uh, Talk that the models are notoriously slow to train. They are very slow to train. That's a very good point. What is the question? Yeah. So the Alex asked a very good question that deep learning models are hard to train and often they take a long time to train. So I am using just 10 epochs, which is the number of times I've passed through the training data. I only do 10 here just so that we um, uh, can do it quickly. If I were to train longer, it's possible that I would uh, uh, do much better. And in fact, if you do 20 or 50 epochs, I guarantee you'll do better um, uh, on these uh, uh, tasks. 
So a lot of this score could, as uh, Alex was intimating perhaps, could be artificially low, right? So this could probably, what we'd hope to see is it would get very close or slightly better than our generative model is the hope. And ditto if we had more unlabeled data. Yes, yeah, exactly. More larger, yeah, more data to train on. If I can just throw one. I mean, yep. So one of the advantages also is that um, these machine learning models like this LSTM um, used to be very far future stuff. Now they're effectively commodity. And there are a lot of other tools um, that are out there and very accessible, like pre-trained um, word embeddings, which are like sort of vector representations of words that capture things like synonymy. Lots of stuff that can be plugged in. All the fancy new models that come out, LSTMs with bi-direction, you know, bi-directional LSTMs with tension and whatnot. This can, it, you know, especially if it's in TensorFlow, which is what we have support for right now, you can just plug it in. So that's another reason why we, we like using this end model is because it just hooks in with all the progress in machine learning. Yeah, these things I showed, these scale up, these all use like word embeddings to to give that extra boost. Um, cool. So have people's models finished training? How, what's the gap between your discriminative model and your generative model? Is it pretty substantial? Yeah. OK. So this is um, a data point. Like Alex said, one strategy is to train it longer. So what you can do, remember this is the end of the uh, uh, pipeline. You could set it to 20 or 30 and then go back and start iterating on your LFs while it's running in the background, right? And so that's one reasonable strategy to see if training it longer would give you more of a boost. And that can just be humming away in the background. So I would suggest trying that. I'm in fact running mine for 20 now just to see if I get any lift. Um, but you've sort of seen the full pipeline now. And it's, uh, this is the big picture. Data programming and snorkel is an iterative process. You use information from all these steps to then revisit and see how you would design new labeling functions.